Uh, thanks, Liz. So, um, as I said, my name is John Krautzer. I'm a third year intern uh, at the Master Gardening Program in Fairfax County. Um, and part of the reason I got into Grow Shelves was because I was very, very interested in trying to elongate the garden season for me. Um, I'm from New Hampshire, where it says a very short garden season. And uh, I lived a long time in Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia, which has break basically a year round garden season. And I like that better. So uh, by building shelves, I was able to um, really get a head start and it really got me in the gardening mood. So if you'll go to the next slide. So grow shelves uh, are a great way to get your garden off to a successful start. Um, they're they're going to help you produce stronger, healthier plants than you would if you just put your, your seeds out or your seedlings out on a windowsill uh, because they're going to have a lot of light um, in the right place. Um, several components can be acquired for free. And when we go and look at my grow shelves, I'll show you what I got for free and what I bought. Um, it's eventually less expensive than having to go and buy uh, seedlings all the time. Um, you can as I mentioned, it's a great indoor hobby um, in the winter time. It really extends uh, your gardening year. Um, and you can also use it, uh, depending on the lights you have, you can also use it for year-round gardening. Um, and I'll show you a picture I have. I've got actually three little grow shelf areas. One's for seed starting. One is kind of a year-round one where I do herbs and some microgreens. And then I have what I call the hospital. Uh, that's where I put house plants or other things that have... Uh, um, don't look like they're doing very well. They're not getting enough light in the window. And we put it in the hospital and usually with a little bit of TLC, it, uh, it gets better. So next. So key components, obviously a shelf. It doesn't have to be a wooden shelf. Um, the one thing that would be very good with it though is to have adjustable shelves. Um, reason being is that everyone that plants different things and as any gardener knows, the things you're interested in growing can change. So if you're just growing, you're just starting little seedlings, you can have a very small shelf, but if you're gonna grow something like say a tomato, tomato seedlings, which will grow a little bit tall before you get a chance to bring them outside, you're gonna want something that's taller. Um, and I originally had my shelves all the same height uh, and that didn't work out very well. So I actually had, I made one a lot bigger and that way I could uh, if something grew taller than I thought it needed or than I thought it would, I could move it to that tall one. It's very easy to put uh, wooden blocks and stuff underneath the plants to raise them closer to the light. Um, next thing is LED grow lights. Um, it's very, you can go on the internet and do a search on the different lights. Different people argue about what's a better light or, or, or not, if whether to have a, a fluorescent or uh, or whatever, but I think most people agree that LED lights, not only do they use very little electricity, but there's a lot of them that are specifically tailored for uh, indoor gardening and grow shelves. Um, I did a lot of research on this before I started and I selected these, they call them kind of these red blue lights. They're kind of purplish um, or pinkish, depending on what, 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 which one you get. But those are very good. If you look at the research, those are very, very good for seed starting. Um, they also help, I believe, in the uh, leaf development. And then for, for kind of year-round gardening, you can get a full spectrum one. But in the, my main grow shelves, I have a pink-blue uh, light. And the pink light, or the red light and the blue light uh, are both, as I said, very, very important for seed starting and getting seedlings off to a good start. Um, I got, got mine on Amazon. There's plenty of manufacturers of them. Um, and you can get either two foot or four foot lengths, depending on what your, how long your shelves are. Next. Um, a heat mat. Um, so a heat mat is important, but it really is dependent upon what you're gonna grow. If you're gonna grow all tomatoes or other heat loving plants, um, you're gonna wanna get one for every shelf. I, I don't have one for every shelf. I have one, uh, I basically have two sets of, of shelves and I have one in each. And basically for uh, my tall grow shelves, I have the heat mat on the bottom. I put anything that's really heat loving down there and anything else just kind of gets the hot air rising heat. Um, and, and I've had no trouble starting it with, with just that. But if you, if you really want hot, uh, like warm, warm weather loving plants, you might get a few of them. So next. Um, next part that I view as being really, really important is another thing that's kind of free 
Um, that's the timer at the top. A lot of us have them around the house. We use them when we go away on vacation so we can turn a light on and hopefully uh, no one robs us. Um, but what I use is I use the one down at the bottom. Um, that is, it's not too, too expensive, but it's something that I can time or I, I can set with my phone. So my phone talks to it. Um, I have an app and I can literally change the lights and time the lights and the fan, which I'll get to in a moment, um, so that they go on and off where I want them. So in the place where I'm doing seed starting, I have the pink blue lights are on for 14 hours a day and they're down for 10. In the place where I'm doing my year, kind of my uh, year round gardening and the microgreens, I have the lights on for, on for 12 and off for 12. Um, I also can use it to control the heat. So the heat, the heat pads will turn on, the heat pads will turn off. And then I turn the fan on at random times throughout the day um, to kind of mimic wind. And that uh, also is something I do through that. All of it's on my phone. Uh, but you can just use a regular uh, timer like the one you see at the top. But it's really a good idea to have some kind of timer. Otherwise, you're relying on yourself to turn it on and turn it off. And it can, it, you know, you can forget it. And, and then suddenly the plant has spent an entire day in darkness. Um, so I think the timer is definitely a good investment. Thanks. So, and the other th things I have, I have a, a little thermometer in each of them, like a cheap aquarium one, but it just helps me get a good idea of the temperature. Um, most seeds need between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit to, to germinate. So um, I do it just to kind of keep an eye on it there. Some, some seeds you'll see on the seed pack, it will say that it requires more. So you can set up an area there where it's a little bit warmer. Um, cups and starter trays. There's lots of different things you can get for this. I use, I, I got, there was a whole bunch of, of solo uh, like picnic cups that were in my house when I bought it. I don't know. I think the people that rented it before we bought it were partiers. They just had a million of these cups. And I just use these cups. I drill holes in the bottom for it, for water to drain. And I put that in another one that holds it if, if the water goes through. And um, I use that. You can use, you can use coconut coir, these peat pellets, if you want, um, as well. You can buy special ones. Um, I do, though, the one thing I do, exception I do have, is I do use peat pots for things like cucumbers, et cetera, that are susceptible to transplant shock. So for any cucumbers I start or squash I start, um, I will start those and keep those in a peat pot that I'll just move entirely. Um, I'll just transplant outside in its entirety there. But everything else I use, literally use red solo cups, as you'll see when we look at pictures. Uh, seed starting mix. Um, one thing I might try next year is making my own. There's a few recipes online for that. Uh, but it's better than potting soil. But absolutely incredibly important is not to use outdoor dirt. Um, you'll bring in bugs, you'll bring in um, just other organisms you don't want inside. Um, suddenly you'll have bugs all over the place because they came out of the soil and you didn't realize it. And they're planning on napping, but they're not napping now because you brought them inside uh, and the temperature got warm. So suddenly you have an infestation of white flies or something like that. So uh, I like seed starting mix. You could use potting soil, but don't use any dirt from outside. Um, next is quality seeds. Uh, and there's a lot of good choices. Uh, several of the really good um, garden centers around here have seeds. I do know um, from uh, Merrifield that there has been, they, they do have seeds, but there's be so many people during COVID have jumped into gardening that there's been kind of a huge rush on seeds. So um, you want to make sure you get your seed sorted out earlier rather than later. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about some of the other places that I like to get seeds, but you want to get good seeds from a, a reputable source. Um, and the, the, some of the major garden centers around here um, do have a great stock of, uh, of seeds. Um, an optional item is liquid fertilizer. I don't use too, too much of this. I have it there available, but it's not always required. But if you do use it, you want to make sure you're watering it, watering it down some. You put it about at half the concentration, and you don't do any fertilizing until after the first true leaves of the plant come out. So you you got your starter leaves. Uh, I should remember what those things are called, and I don't remember it. But um, once those go and you get your first true leaves of the plant, then you can start if you want to occasionally give it some liquid fertilizer. 
Um, but I, I don't do that too, too much, uh, but it's an option for you. Next. And then there's some optional components. Now, um, I included the picture here. You can see this is my kind of year round one, but you can see all around it, I've got uh, Mylar. That's the kind of shiny mirror stuff. Um, so if you do a Google search on indoor grow shelves, 98% of what you find is for cannabis. Uh, there's the people who grow cannabis inside or they, you know, hiding it in their closet. They've done a ton of research on how to do this right. And so a lot of times when I was research building these, a lot of times it brings you to, to cannabis. And Mylar is one of the things that they use a lot. Mylar is, is just, uh, you've seen them sometimes at like marathons or emergency centers. The, um, they're like, they're, they're the emergency uh, blanket. Whoops. They're the emergency blankets that they, they give out sometimes. Um, that, that material is developed by NASA. It's called Mylar. It's not too expensive. But in a study of growing cannabis, they showed that cannabis grew 26% faster um, with Mylar all around it than not. So for one of mine, I put that Mylar all around it. And I think it's really had good success. It just reflects the light more. Um, I'll show you in a bit the small fan that I have. Uh, and I have the fan, it turns on and off five different times during the day. Um, and it basically just mimics the wind and it enables the plants to be a little bit stronger because they're used to having, uh, that rather than have it be somewhere that's so sterile that, you know, by when you bring them outside, it's such a shock to be in the real world that they'll, you know, they'll fall over and break easily. And then the last thing, an optional component, uh, that pink blue light is really cool for the, about the first three minutes. And then after that, you get tired of that color. It gets very, it seems very, very bright. So you're, you're going to want to probably have a curtain or some kind of light block there. Um, I've got a giant piece of kind of craft paper that I put over top of mine um, that covers it just so that when I'm, it, I have mine in my workshop and uh, when I'm down there doing other things, uh, I like that light to be covered. So next slide. So yeah, here's just a few of the pictures. So this is my total setup here. Um, if you look at the right, you can see the pink blue uh, lights there. The, of course, they're somewhat empty right now because um, I'm not starting anything yet. Those are just kind of more or less experiments I have, but those three shelves are, are where I start my seeds. Um, the bottom shelf that has white light, that's my little hospital. And then on the, on the left there, you can see the inside. I got Mylar covering the outside, but you can see in there. And what I'll do in this, when I start to grow seeds is I'll start them in the, in the blue green, or the, sorry, the red blue area. Once they get up and they get to be a, you know, a couple inches tall, then I will move them over to the full spectrum light before transplanting them outside. Next. So here, and just to show you the various components. So there's the LED lights on the right. I've got two two foot lights per shelf. On the left, I've got six lights. They're just, you know, three or four inches uh, apart each. Um, next. So then there's the heat pad. As I mentioned, I got, the, I got it on the, on the shelf. It's on the left, it's, it's, or on the right, it's down low. And on the right, I've got it kind of in the middle. There's the Mylar I talked about already. And then it's an uh, electrician would not necessarily be proud of this, but this is my uh, outlets and timer. So you can see the timer up there to the left with all those plugs in it. And, and then on the right, I've got a power, uh, power cord, which plugs into that actually that timer. So I have everything, everything set to change, to uh, go on and off at the times I would like it. And it uh, doesn't take a lot of research online to, to get a good idea of what plants like a lot of light, which don't uh, temperatures, et cetera. Um, and then just the other components I've got here, I've got a thermometer on the left. There's the fan um, there on the right, which I turn on. Um, but one thing I'll point out here, so this is the picture here on the right with the, the blue pink light. Um, that's actually from last winter. So that's, uh, you can see a couple of my tomatoes. Um, I think the ones on the right I, are columbine in, in, the, in the, uh, the black round thing. Um, and then up to the left are milkweed. And I'm not quite sure uh, what's there in, in the front, the, in the egg carton. Um, that was my attempt actually to build uh, seed starting pods out of toilet paper rolls. 
Um, that was a, a miserable failure. I will not be doing that again. They all fell apart uh, very quickly. But you can kind of see what I do is I put wooden blocks underneath them so I can raise them up to the lights. Some people buy fancy grow shelves where they're lowering the lights down or whatever. I have so much wood scraps that I just put them under. And then as the plant grows, I take wood out from it. And, and, and I find that to be a free alternative to having to develop some kind of pulley system. The next. So when you're building the shelves, there's a couple of important build considerations to take, in pla take place. One is you're gonna wanna locate uh, the shelves somewhere that are not gonna have huge temperature swings. So it's probably not a good idea to have it in like a three season porch or something if it's gonna go through very major swings. Um, uh, you're also gonna wanna make sure you have it close to a water source. Um, depending on how much you grow, you don't want to uh, have to be lugging a lot of water. So you're gonna to wanna to have it somewhere that um, you have a sink somewhat nearby. Um, basements usually work great. Um, I have mine in my basement. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, making one of the shelves a little bit larger than the other ones is a good idea. I learned this the hard way. Um, it, and it was the hard way because I had to rewire uh, the lights because I had, I had set them up perfectly with all the even you know shelves evenly spaced. And then I had to do some new wiring to get that one to be a little bit bigger. Um, you're going to want to make sure you have a, enough outlets nearby. I had one big outlet bank there that you saw, uh, but when I was doing research for this, I discovered that a lot of people have put these together, and then when they got it all done, they went to plug it in, and there was no plug anywhere nearby, so they have to run an extension cord across the floor, um, which is a tripping hazard. Um, and I mentioned already about, you know, some people have a fancy pulley that lowers the lights, and you can raise them as the plant gets bigger, but I just put wood scraps underneath. Um, so, one of the key things, the really, the really uh, important things to, to, to know is when do you start uh, growing in, in your grow shelves? So, I think a lot of people, uh, myself included, get very excited about this and they're like, oh, they want to start right away. They want to, um, you know, they want to get something going. And if you do it too early, what you end up having is you end up having something that's ready to be transplanted um way too early it's still too cold out for it so you end up making the shelf bigger and and then it's inside it's not getting any of the natural light outside at all it's not it's you know kind of in this somewhat of a sterile environment and it's it's just it ends up being inside longer than it needs to be and it doesn't turn into a, a, a very productive plant so um i use a couple of different sources to to help direct me as to when to plant um Virginia Tech's got uh, a really nice publication I'm going to show you on the next page um, for when we should plant things in our zone, which is uh, 7A for most of us. Um, but another site I like a lot is the Farmer's Almanac. Now, it's not a .edu site, but I kind of consider it scientific. Um, I love the Farmer's Almanac website. They've got all sorts of great videos, but um, they have a neat planting tool where you type in your zip code and it will print out for you when to plant seeds indoors, when to plant seeds outdoors, and when to transplant basically every vegetable that you would possibly grow. Um, so I've used that. And so I've got my little spreadsheet uh, already. So I know that I'm planting my peppers on uh, February, or I, I think it's peppers, on February 8th um, is the first thing I plant. And it, it just goes from there all the way to, um, uh, the rest of the spring. Um, so I just work backwards. The seed packets um, will also tell you when you ought to be planting, but just be very careful not to bring stuff outside too early or plant things too early. Uh, I will be the first to admit I make this mistake as well. Last year, uh, I brought two of my tomatoes out around the middle of March. It seemed like so nice a weather. There was no way we we're going to get snow again. And of course, we get some cold weather again. I had to go out, put buckets on them. The, the, my tomato, those two tomatoes survived, but they, they weren't as productive as they could have been. So be very careful not to bring stuff out too early, um, uh, as tempting as it might be. Next. So here's the uh, Virginia's Home Garden Vegetable Planning Guide. Um, and I think you'll, you'll be getting a link to it um, afterwards. But the... Um, 
It also has great guidance as to when to plant each of the vegetables that you might be interested in. I, as I mentioned, I did this a lot for flowers as well. There's not as many guides for that, but, but generally the seed packet will help you out with that as well. Uh, but for vegetables, for sure, this guide is uh, very, very useful. Um, and then I got just a couple of uh, operational considerations to, to, to take into account. Um, in general, uh, the amount of light that gets to the plant dissipates kind of exponentially the farther away you're from it, meaning that if the plant is three inches from the light, it doesn't get half the light if it's six inches away. It gets a lot less than that. So you want to start the seeds off about two to four inches below the lights by propping them up and then you lower it as the plant goes, but you're gonna want those, those plants to be very close to the lights um, in order to get the most, out of the, uh, the most out of them, help them grow stronger. Um, I mentioned already, I don't know, I have this in again, to you know, put a sheet or a curtain over top if you don't like that, that pink purple hue. Um, watering is essential, but the number one, in, in my experience and in talking to other gardeners, the, the, the top uh, cause of failure in these is people overwatering the plants. They see something, oh, it's starting to, you know, it, it, the plant has a problem that they're misdiagnosing as wilting. And so they water, 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 and then the plant basically drowns or has a problem with root rot. So watering is important, but be careful not to overwater. Um, and then for seedlings, uh, I use 14 hours a day of light and then 10 hours of dark. Um, as kind of my comments when I'm starting seeds. Um, however, if you're using it for year round gardening, um, like the microgreens, et cetera, um, there's, there's a different, uh, different light settings and you can go on and, and, and research what types of plants like stuff. Just give you an example. Um, for that one garden I have, the, the white one where I'm doing year round gardening, um, I do mostly herbs in there. I don't have that go for more than 12 hours a day because if I do longer than that, the basil and cilantro will bolt and, and you don't want that. So a lot less light there, a lot more for my seedlings. But again, you can look, um, you can look on, on the seed packet or online to see what, uh, what the light requirements are for the various things you decide to plant and you'd set your, your lights accordingly. Another good reason to have the timer because that way you don't have to remember, oh God, what time did I turn this on this morning? I got my coffee and then I uh, was this, did I take a shower for, yeah then you're just, you don't have to worry about that. Just the, It's just on the timer. All you have to do is water it and talk to them. Uh, next. Um, some gardeners, including myself, uh, choose to have the, the heat pad on the timer so that it more mimics a little bit of the temperature changes that the plant will go through in the real world. You don't have to do that, uh, but some people like to do it and I like to do it. I can't tell you that it, it worked better or worse than the other way, but just, uh, um, something to keep in mind. Uh, often when people don't do it, it's because they're just out of outlets. Um, I, you know, I check on the plants every day. I, I rotate them about a quarter turn. I don't know if there's any science behind that, but I like to move them around. I also move them around because I have a fan and I don't want the fan to blow all on just the one plant closest to it and not really hit the ones in the back. So I move them all around so that particularly my basil can get, uh, um, kind of wind from a lot of different directions um, and it really makes them strong. Um, now, one key thing though on the fan, if you're gonna use a fan, that's great, but it's still important to harden your seedlings before you bring them outside full time. Um, hardening the seedlings, um, yes, it does do something to help make them stronger, but possibly the, the more important thing is it helps a plant get used to the sun's light, which has a lot of UV in it and other things that it's not getting out of the LED lights in the basement. So even if you have a fan in there, you still have to go through the process of hardening the plants, um, which I don't have the you know uh, pr presentation on, but um, you, uh, and I think other people have, uh, I think last week we were talking about starting seedlings, the, uh, they, they touched on this, but it's just bringing it outside for an hour one day and then two hours the next day. You start it off in a kind of a shady spot. You gradually let the plant get acclimated to um, the natural surroundings. Uh, but it's important to do that even if you have a fan. Next. And then some final tips. And these are all kind of lessons I learned the hard way. Um, I used to use a small water bottle. Actually, it's my hockey water bottle from when I would play hockey. 
uh, and it's like a liter big. So I would fill this up all the time. It'd have to be going back and forth and filling. It. And I finally, I had a, I, I found a, a, a used two gallon sprayer that people would use to put, you know, pesticide or whatever on uh, fruit trees. And I thoroughly, thoroughly cleaned it out and I filled it with water and I used that and it lasts me for a long, long time. Um, and it's got a nice long wand so I can reach in the back of these shelves, the one that's really deep. Um, that makes it so much easier to water. Um, in addition to the seed catalogs, um, which are now all coming out for those of you who've signed up for them, and local gardening centers, one of the things I've, I've started to do last year was to use Etsy uh, to get seeds. And uh, Etsy, uh, uh, most people I think know Etsy, they usually affiliate it with like artsy type things. You know, you can buy, uh, you know, special cute little signs for, for your house or, you know, different crochet things or whatnot. But what I found is that a lot of small mom and pop farms have gotten into selling their seeds on Etsy. A lot of heirloom varieties, um, lots of, oops, um, lots of really interesting, yeah, thanks. Uh, lots of really interesting seeds. And so uh, I would look at Etsy and take a look if it's something specific you want. Just the only advice I'd have is make sure it's coming from the United States. Um, it's illegal, I think, unless they have a license to send overseas, but every once in a while, I'll see something really neat on Etsy, and then I find out it's shipping from Bulgaria or Kyrgyzstan or something like that. So you wanna make sure it's coming from the US. Um, not every plant is set up to be started inside. Um, squash and cucumbers and melons, you have to be very, very careful where they have very, very tender roots. Um, and so I start those in um, the peat pots. Um, I don't start beans or peas inside. I plant those directly outside um, just because I've, the transplanting, just the very sensitive things, it doesn't make any sense to start root vegetables inside. Um, there's some varieties of radishes. They seem to be fully grown in three days. So you know, there's no need to start that in advance. Uh, you can just start that kind of stuff outside. And then last slide. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, also don't forget flowers. Most of what I started last year were flowers. Uh, I, I had this big kick on native, native plants. So I did all this milkweed and cardinal flower and other things. And um, I had a lot of success with them. Um, and one of the things that's nice is if you get them going inside, there's a number of types of flowers, like bee balm, for example, they don't really flower that first year. But some of those plants, if you get them started inside, you can get flowers if, we, if it stays warm enough outside the first year. Um, so that's the seedlings make a great gift. I have been bringing them to, you know, I'll start something off. I've already said the list of what I got seeds for to my neighbors. So a couple of people have said, oh, I want, you know, yeah, I'd love one of those okra seedlings or tomato seedlings of, of one variety or another. Um, so those are always nice uh, to give out. And then when you're done, you can move on to your next uh, project. And these are just on the right. I have a couple of things I also built this year. Um, at the top, that's my uh, um, uh, cold frame. So I'm going to use that this year to harden, uh, harden off my plants and maybe grow herbs. Uh, that's 100% recycled. Uh, the only thing I bought for that is the paint. Um, there's a, a screen door glass on it. And then on the right um, is a, a gutter garden. I grew all my lettuce in that this year. Um, so that is it. Does anyone have any questions on the grow, on the do-it-yourself grow shelves? Thanks so much, John. That was um, really great. I, I really appreciated how you, you addressed the the lighting difference in terms of uh, length of time between the seed, the needs between the seedlings and the year round plants that you're growing. I, I've been experimenting hit or miss with indoor lights for my house plants and my orchids. And um, you know, I really hadn't, hadn't thought about different needs. And, and my gosh, I, I just uh, foot stomp your recommendation on the timers because mm -hmm. <laughs> I tried it without them and it was, is maddening. Um, did, did not work for consistency at all. I did have a question on your timer though. Mm -hmm. It looked like in your setup, you had um, your fan and the lights, you had everything tie plugged into the one timer. Yeah. Well, what I did was I had um, 
the the timer has six outlets and three USBs that I can control all. Ah, okay. H oh, however, so you may, you can control it. That's right. You said yeah. you had your uh, app on your phone. Yeah. Okay. Although I did, I did one of those outlets went to a power strip, and so I controlled a number of things from the one thing just to yeah, turn so on. So you can off independently control the devices that are all plugged yeah. into that one timer. I got it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's why that thing's nice. It's like $20 or whatever, but yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very, very useful. I've actually got a few of them. I use them for other things in the house as well, including my fish tank. Yeah. And then, um, well, if people are thinking about any questions they might have, um, during non-COVID times, um, you, we're very fortunate to be in Northern Virginia. A number of the master gardener units and the um, and gardening clubs and the public libraries have seed exchanges. So I know um, Fall, one of the libraries in Falls Church, one of the libraries in Arlington, actually even has a, a, a gardening shed you can check out garden tools from. And then uh, two libraries in Fairfax County, and I'm sorry, I can't remember their names, but um, also do seed exchanges. But of course, during COVID, the in-person seed exchanges um, have were suspended. But um, we, you know, maybe by the fall, <clears throat> we'll have some some seed exchanges back. And if you're if you uh, subscribe to any of the the listservs, um, Plant Nova Natives or Virginia Native Plant Society, um, they'll often put out a call. For people who have seeds. Um, to give away, we'll put it out there on those listservs. So just another thought on, on getting seeds from various sources. Any, any questions for John from anyone else? Yeah, I, I have some comments to add. Sure, go ahead. Okay, just making sure you heard me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. John, that was a terrific presentation okay. and uh, also reflected some of the lessons learned or lessons I've learned um, on some of the pitfalls. Uh, I just wanted to share that I've used, the basement is, is the best place for me too, but I've used a banquet table and workbenches. And so it's flat. I thought I joined the presentation because I wanted to see what you've done with shelves, but there's all sorts of kits out there and expensive ones you can buy. But the banquet table is great because it's it's big, and I set up the lights on P, uh, PVC stands. I'm sure you've seen this, and then hang them shop lights. I've got kind of a mixture of lights I've accumulated on chains with hooks, mm -hmm. so it's not a fancy store bought pulley thing, but it's very easy to adjust the lights, particularly because I'm growing my seedlings uh, after they get big enough to, to thin out or, or transplant in trays mm -hmm. onto the lights. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a different approach mm -hmm. uh, that's worked well uh, for me. And the tray, you know, the logistics of this, the space and move, moving things around it can be challenging, uh, particularly like the hardening off, kind of practical things you don't think about sometimes, you know, moving the seedlings in and out while you're doing the hardening off. Uh, a, a good uh, sturdy tray uh, helps versus, you know, doing small numbers by hand. Yeah. So just, just sharing s some experiences, but that was, you covered the subject very, very well. And I, I learned some things uh, that I'm, I can I'm use. I'm glad. Yeah, I remember uh, when I did hardening, it was six trips from the yeah. basement to the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a sturdy tray, but you know, you yeah. don't want to drop anything. You don't want to wiggle them around too much. Well, that is, this is what happens if you have a one of these flimsy plastic trays, which are fine, but they're not very sturdy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you end up dropping stuff, but um, I got some trays. I'll, I'm not endorsing Gardener Supply. Oh, I love Gardener uh, Supply. You can endorse well, them if you'd like. Yeah. You know, Master Gardener, we're not, you know, supposed to do that. But they had some terrific uh, plastic trays. They're really nice. 
uh, for moving uh, seedlings around here. It, was, it improved my quality of life for uh, shuffling seedlings around. Mm -hmm. And there's also a tendency to, to grow too much or too many. And your point about sharing with the neighbors is really satisfying because you tend to want to nurture your babies and not throw them away, but you can end up with way too many seedlings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you spend a bunch of time keeping them alive. So I've, yeah. I've got to be a little, little less uh, sentimental mm -hmm. and just give them away and clip them with a small pair of scissors to make room for the, the healthy ones. Thanks again. Hey, yep. thank